thank you for joining the first virtual forum event hosted by the Institute for Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School of Public Policy, known to many of you as GU Politics. My name is Kelvin Doe, and I am a freshman in the college studying political economy. Throughout my first year at Georgetown, I have had the opportunity to be a member of GU Politics' amazing pre-orientation program. I also attended the weekly discussion sessions from last semester's outstanding class of fellows, which included one of our guests, Dr. Jeff Collier. This semester, thanks to GU Politics, I was a member of the Iowa cohort. Along with five other students, I witnessed the Iowa caucus in action and had a once in a lifetime experience meeting the candidates and political operatives that make one of the biggest events in American politics. I am pleased to introduce our four esteemed panelists who are joining us tonight. Dr. Jeff Collier, former governor in Kansas and member of the National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services, who some of you may recognize from his time on campus last semester as a GU Politics Fellow. Dr. Rebecca Katz, Director of Georgetown's Center for Global Health Science and Security. Ron Klain, former U.S. Ebola Response Coordinator for the Obama Administration. And Tony Saig, former Assistant Secretary of the Treas Treasury for the Trump Administration, another former G Politics Fellow. Thank you all for being here to share your wisdom with us tonight. Our panel tonight, which is co-sponsored by Georgetown's Global Health Initiative, will be moderated by Geopolitics Executive Director Mo Aliti, who is going to kick us off. Calvin, thanks so much uh, for your introduction and for um, your participation in geopolitics. I'm glad you were able to join us in Iowa. Um, it might be the last time we take a trip to Iowa uh, to monitor the caucuses. Uh, but that's a that's a discussion for another uh, another night. Um, I want to welcome everyone uh, to our, uh, as Calvin said, our very first event uh, in this virtual era. Uh, and from what I understand, might be one of the first big events uh, the campus has done uh, since we've moved to this model. Um, hopefully, many of you, the students who are participating, have gotten a little used to to this technology since um, your classes have all been done uh, via Zoom for the past few days. Um, we'll hopefully be able to move through this with as few technical um, uh, challenges as possible, but please be patient with us if there are any. So uh, for we also have uh, quite a few people who will be joining us, not through the Zoom platform, but through our live stream on our Facebook Live page. This event is being recorded and posted on our social channels for later viewing as well. Um, when we get to the portion of the conversation in a little bit, uh, where we'll be taking your Q&A, uh, the students who are participating via the Zoom platform, you will be, um, uh, you should submit your questions looking down below at the, for the Q&A tab. Um, just click on that and submit your questions and if selected, uh, someone from our team will send you a private message letting you know that we'll be looping you in shortly. So keep an eye on your chat. Um, please do not use the raise hand command unless you're asked to by someone from our staff. Uh, for those members of the Georgetown staff and faculty who pre-registered, you should have received instructions earlier today on how to submit questions through email earlier this afternoon and please refer to those instructions. I wanna thank our partners in this conversation, Georgetown's Global Health Initiative uh, for uh, co-sponsoring us. I also wanna thank uh, our technical partners, Optimum Audio and AI Media for helping us uh, with this as well. In a moment, we'll get started, but I wanna encourage the audience to be part of the conversation even before the Q&A Feel free to share your thoughts on social media, on any of the social media platforms using the hashtag GU Virtual Forum and by tagging at GU Politics across our channels. So, uh, you know, as we were trying to figure out what our first event in this new virtual era was going to be, uh, I, I think we all realized it would be pretty silly to do anything uh, but this one. The coronavirus. Uh, crisis 
uh, pandemic has changed really the fabric of all of our social interactions in ways that were unfathomable to us just a few weeks ago. And while there's no shortage of conversations about how it's doing that, we wanted to have a conversation true to the mission of the Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCord School uh, to really kind of focus on what this means for leadership. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What are the very difficult decisions that our leaders, whether it's the international community, whether it is our federal officials, whether it's our state and local officials, what are some of the economic challenges that we face? How are our leaders grappling with them? What, are they, what have they been doing? What do they need to be doing moving forward? And I could not be more thrilled to have this particular panel of experts join us for this conversation. So with that, I wanna start uh, with Rebecca and ask you just to kind of set the table for us, help us understand from a pandemic preparedness perspective, how we got to the point that we're at now, and were we really, as a as global community, as unprepared for this as I think a lot of us feel like we might have been? Um, hopefully you can hear me all right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really privileged to be with all of you tonight and, and especially with this group of, of panelists. I think to start with, I, well, I think anytime I've been speaking about, about the outbreak, I, I always start with the numbers because it's important for us to remember exactly where we are right now. And um, so th this outbreak started in so probably sometime in November and was first reported by the Chinese government at the end of December. Uh, in that time, we are now at, and this number has jumped over 22,000 today, we are now at 242,191 cases around the world. The, um, with the highest number of deaths right now coming out of Italy. And in the United States, we are now at 13,159 cases with 176 deaths. And we have doubled, over doubled since about midday on Wednesday. So we are in the midst clearly of a, um, of a pandemic. We have widespread community transmission of this virus. We are now in 160 countries around the world. And uh, I think we are, as a, as a global community, really struggling, well, struggling unevenly. Different parts of the world are, seem to be in a better position. Um, and I think it gets to your question, are we prepared? Were we prepared? And I should note that um, several years ago, uh, actually, the, the very beginning of the, the, the week before inauguration of the Trump administration, we actually held an event at Georgetown on pandemic preparedness for the next administration. Ron was actually one of the speakers at this event. And the, the point of that was to look back at what, where, where have we come from and, and where were we going? And I think, I think we are, the last 20 years, the United States and the rest of the world has put a lot of effort into pandemic preparedness, but clearly insufficient. And, and because it just wasn't prioritized. And I think what we're seeing right now is in parts of the world that had experience with SARS, with H5N1, with H1N1, and even with MERS outbreaks, that they, not only was the government, um, but also the population was much more prepared for the realities of what an outbreak um, a, a dangerous outbreak in their midst would be like. So to the question of are, were, were we prepared? I, again, a lot of effort and money and time had been going into this, but it was really very much focused in a, in a somewhat insular community. And I think that the, the public health professionals were, were on board. We had, we had developed an entire new uh, sub-discipline in global health security, and which is the focus of what we do our research on. So clearly, we, we, our, our discipline was focused on thinking about how we um, prevent, detect, and respond to public health emergencies. There was a lot of effort to try to implement the international health regulations. The Obama administration was uh, rolled out the global health security agenda to try to marshal resources and build those capacities around the world. But it, it still clearly has been insufficient, and there was still major gaps around the world in capacity. 
let me follow up before I, 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 I move on to Ron, but let me follow up with you with, with one particular question. And that is, look, this thing has seems to have hit every corner, uh, every part of the globe. No one is, uh, there's no nation that's really unscathed at this point. But there, it, it appears at least from my layman's perspective that certain countries have dealt with it better than others, right? And I'm wondering if maybe you can comment on that. Why are some countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea seem to have, have a better grasp on it than other countries like Italy and Iran? And where you think the United States is on that spectrum? Mm, so I think, well, well, first, let me say that um, China, which had over 80,000 cases uh, in the last 24 hours, had de- has had zero indigenous cases. So there are now zero cases coming out of Wuhan. Um, and that is a, a society that is now slowly returning to, I won't call it the normal, but maybe a new normal. Um, if we look at South Korea and Singapore, Taiwan, Hong, all these, Hong Kong, um, these are all places that, again, they were, they were um, maybe a little bit more aware of what the threats were. And if we take South Korea, not only have they dealt with SARS, but also with outbreaks of MERS, um, a large outbreak in 2015 that required a, a major quarantine and then uh, a rapid response in 2018. And because of this, this was, again, a government that was ready to act. They, did, uh, they rolled out testing immediately. They did widespread testing, immediately did uh, isolation, quarantine, contact tracing, the utilization of, of, of technologies for contact tracing, and, and a population that um, not only understood the threat, but was willing to comply with the directions of the government. Um, thanks. Uh, Ron, um, you've got some experience coordinating the federal government's response to a pandemic. Um, it, I was struck by a story I read in the New York Times this, just this afternoon, that just broke this afternoon, about how less than one year ago, just within the last year, the federal government, the, uh, through the Department uh, of Health and Human Services, ran a simulation, which they called Crimson Contagion. In this simulation, they dealt with a respiratory virus that started in China that quickly spread around the world by air travelers who ran high fevers. It was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization and eventually led in the simulation to 110 million Americans ill, 7.7 million hospitalized, and 586,000 dead. They just ran this simulation less than a year ago. So my question to you, um, as, as our institute, part of the McCord School of Public Policy, whose mission in part is evidence-based policymaking uh, and preparing the next generation of policymakers uh, to think in that way, where, how has our federal government, which has been preparing for this, how did they let it get to this point here in the United States how has the response been so far? And then most importantly, what are the, what's the next big thing in this crisis that they need to be getting ready for? So Mo, I think that the response will be studied for generations as a textbook example of a disastrous, failed, flawed effort. And I know that sounds harsh, but um, I think that's the reality of what we're dealing with. And and let me start by saying that's not a partisan observation in the sense that I uh, praise the action of many Republican governors, Governor DeWine, Governor Hogan, Governor Baker, who've done a really good job with this. Uh, Also Democratic governors too, Governor Cuomo, Governor Whitmer. But what's happened in Washington has been a fiasco of incredible proportions. First, uh, President Trump touted the fact that he was putting travel restrictions on China as the solution. He told us he had sealed the borders tight and yet he hadn't. Travelers were still coming here from China, goods, services were coming here from China, and obviously the disease came here from China, and then from other parts of the world too. And those travel restrictions slowed the spread of the disease, but they bought us time, not protection. And with that time, the Trump administration squandered the opportunity. They did not prepare us for testing. We have fallen behind every other developed country in the world for testing its people for this virus. There's no reason why the United States 
should be so far behind. To give an example, even today, even with what's going on with accelerating testing yet, we still probably tested about 200 out of every million Americans, maybe 250 now. In Korea, they've tested 5,000 out of every million Koreans. There's no reason why we couldn't match that. So we had warning. We didn't get the tests ready. Now, if you ask what's happening next, our hospitals are about to be overrun with patients. The numbers Rebecca cited earlier, this disease is doubling every one and a half days in the United States. Emergency rooms, ICUs, are going to fill with patients. We haven't prepared the beds for those patients. We don't have the ICU beds for those patients. And in fact, we don't even have the basic protection for our medical professionals. There are doctors and nurses tonight treating patients with this disease without masks, without gowns, without protective gear. And all of this was perfectly foreseeable in January, and there was a lack of action to get ready for what we're facing. And so we're seeing this disease spread quickly in the country, we didn't do the testing right. We didn't do the contact tracing. We didn't get the hospitals ready. We don't have the equipment where it needs to be. And we're going to see the consequences of that in the days ahead. So, Jeff, let me, let me ask you. Ron just um, gave some, I think, very appropriate praise to a number of governors. Um, and I think governors on both sides of the aisle around the country, mayors on both sides of the aisle around the country, um, who are on the front lines of dealing with the pandemic in their communities um, have been doing some some uh, tremendous work. Um, but having said that, I just at moments before we convened tonight, I just saw the mayor of New York City on television saying that he expects that they're going to be they're going to run out of medical supplies within two to three weeks. The uh, president today did a conference call with the nation's governors from the FEMA headquarters. Uh, in which governor after governor was make, were, were sort of making requests and in some cases pleas to the to the federal government for more resources of all types. So I'm wondering if maybe you can putting on your old, your old gubernatorial hat talk a little bit about the state and local response, what you think their biggest challenges are, and what they can do at their level, and maybe talk a little bit about some of the unique challenges, being a member of the president's uh, National Rural Health Advisory Board, you know, a lot of these rural communities are the ones that have already the least access to health care. How are they going to be dealing uh, with this crisis? Well, let's, let's talk about a couple of the, those aspects. Uh, one is, this is a time that you really have to have decisive leadership and that's two words. One of those is sometimes leaders, it takes time for them to make a decision. And this is one where you don't have a lot of time. When you have a doubling time happening every day and a half, you're on this hockey stick and you don't know what's going on. And then suddenly, boom. And that's what we're experiencing now. So sometimes we have leaders that that decision tree, it t it's taking them time to make those decisions. Now, I've also seen leaders have tried to be decisive, but they can't get people to follow along uh, with them. That, you know, if they close down certain aspects, you know, they close down to beaches and things, they can't keep people off the beaches. And so both of those words have to be operative here. And the leadership aspect of this is absolutely critical. That you really got to have a leader that's out communicating every single day. You're out everywhere, all over, your, all over your community, or at least talking to a wide variety of leaders because people haven't experienced this kind of war. And this is a war that is on our shores right now. So we're in an entirely different environment and a different political and decision-making environment. Now, I think there's a lot of impacts uh, on this and most of the news media covers what's happening in Boston, New York, Kansas City, uh, for that matter. Um, and, but one of the places that is most vulnerable are our rural areas. Rural Americans are about 60 million of the United States. And in places like Kansas, uh, while we have cities of a million people, we also have cities of 300. And we have about 100, uh, over 100 small hospitals scattered across the state 
It may have one or two doctors, one or two, and maybe a dozen nurses, uh, maybe 20 beds, maybe an, an average hospital census of one to five people a night. What happens with them, though, they don't have a whole lot of backup. So, for example, one coronavirus patient has walked into one emergency room uh, in, in a major hospital uh, here in the United States, and 28 people got, were now put in quarantine. You lose an entire shift and all of your ER doctors. Uh, you, lose your, you even lose your security guards uh, in this. When that, if that happens in a rural community and you lose you know, the, the one of the two docs that are in that community, it's devastating for all the other things that are going on as well. Do you think yeah, our, yeah. Do you, do you, uh, let me let me add ahead. one other thing is, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion going on about bailouts and things. Most of these rural hospitals, I mean, they have a weekly payroll, you know, that's, you know, maybe $70,000, you know, every two weeks or $100,000. They actually go paycheck to paycheck for an entire hospital. And many of these are looking at economic ruin. And it's something that can happen very, very quickly, that people could be without a paycheck. Do you think our states and, and cities, our local officials are getting the support they need from the federal government? What's the, what would you say is the single most important thing that the federal government can, can do to assist our governors and our mayors in this next phase? I think that and the next phase is going to be when we're starting to see a rapid ramp up uh, where you're going to start seeing a lot more cases. And uh, we're, we're just starting to see them walking into the emergency rooms now. Um, this is going to be a very difficult phase. This is one where the federal government needs to have a lot of information uh, out to people. They have to be talking to people right away. Most of these situations, we are far short of anything uh, of, of supplies, things like that. Um, but one of the things is they can smooth a lot of issues. For example, how to get licensed. You know, we can move all of our medical licensure online and literally transfer that within an hour where anybody could do this. There are new drugs and therapies. One that's just announced today uh, that's very important. We're going to have an op-ed in the newspaper uh, in the next day or two. But there is a medication uh, called hydroxychloroquine, for example, that in France, in China, has actually reduced the amount uh, of transmission of the virus. And what that means is if you use this drug, it's a very common drug, but if you would use it strategically, you might be able to blunt some of the effects of it. If those things are out there, the federal government needs to get behind them, explain them, fund them, do those things. Tony, there's been obviously a lot of conversation about the economic impact of the crisis. Um, I, there isn't anyone out there that I've heard that doesn't say this, that we're not headed towards a pretty uh, severe recession. Um, and, you know, even your former boss, Secretary Mnuchin, said that worst case scenario, we could see upwards of 20% unemployment uh, if this crisis uh, bears out. Now, the federal government has done some things, right? There was a bipartisan agreement that the president just signed providing for some economic relief for families um, through uh, primarily paid emergency leave and offering free testing. And now there's uh, another uh, package working its way through the Congress um, with um, that's more of a direct stimulus that could include direct payments to taxpayers um, and some stimulus, some funding to the airline industry, to small businesses and, and other impacted sectors. But a lot of critics say that, you know, the price tag on that about one trillion isn't enough, that we might need to triple that for it to really uh, uh, stem the economic impact. So my, my question to you is, at a time when people aren't able to go into work, so many people are struggling. What what are the real econo What is the real economic risk of this crisis, and what more do we need to do to combat it? 
Mo, thank you for having me. And I'll start by saying what we've all said in one way, shape, or form, which is this is an unprecedented global crisis uh, for and challenge for which there really is no established playbook. And you know, while we have seen um, some coverage uh, in the media, certainly of some partisan rancor in Washington that's dominated much of the, the past few years. On the economic relief side, I can happily report there is actually a good amount of bipartisanship, and that's very important because you, we do have um, government that is split between you know, Democrats controlling the House, Republicans in the Senate and the White House, and we've seen, I think, very quick action taken. So you've mentioned phase one, phase two. Those were a bit smaller. Those were a little bit more targeted as far as economic relief. Um, phase two touched on, to your point, uh, extending on insurance benefits, supporting Medicaid funding and expanding the, to help uh, SNAP and other food programs. Of course, paid family and sick leave were very important uh, in those respects. Uh, they taught, touched on testing and funding, testing for uh, uninsured uh, Americans so they could have access to it and small business funding. What we're debating tonight, and I think it's very significant, um, is basically a trillion dollars that's mostly targeted toward Main Street. This is the largest federal assistance to Main Street we've had certainly in, in history uh, in scale of magnitude. You have 500 billion of that, largely half of that, that's targeted towards small businesses of under 500 employees that represent 40% of the workforce. And when you, you cite Secretary Mnuchin's concern, it is legitimately about the labor market and the fact that if you don't provide liquidity, uh, to businesses and to taxpayers, they're going to be unable to really sustain a steep economic downturn in the hope of a quicker recovery after. So that's why you're seeing so much emphasis on providing these small businesses with liquidity, because that goes to payrolls, that goes to keeping employees um, you know, with their jobs, that goes to funding operating costs that keep their doors open. That's essential, and that's really a Main Street targeted uh, piece of this. Uh, sorry, that's 300 billion. The 500 billion is the direct checks to the American people. We're starting to see the contours of that, probably uh, targeted toward middle income families, those individuals making $75,000 and under, uh, combined families making 150 and under. They need direct stimulus. That's the most efficient way we're going to get money in their pockets and and avoid the complexity that that a larger, maybe even more perfect solution down the road uh, would provide. But in the meantime, this is a much more acute downturn. And remember, when you're talking about liquidity, okay, you're talking about the fact that everyone's cost, whether you're a business or an individual, largely remain the same and your cash is dropping because you're either not making the income or you're not making the revenue if you're a business. The last piece is a $200 billion of basically uh, secured lending to critical companies. Um, you know, airlines are part of that. Clearly, that's going to be another important part of making sure that the economy doesn't collapse in this time or at least sectors of the economy doesn't collapse again, in hopes of rebuilding rather quickly uh, once we've weathered this largely public health storm. And, and I just do want to address one thing and maybe the prerogative of going last. Um, I personally believe that to view this entire crisis um, that's being managed in real time by a lot of people who are working very hard through a partisan lens misses the point. I think there's a lot of leadership you have Governor Cuomo and Governor Newsom from New York and California, respectively, uh, who do not like President Trump, have never been shy about their dislike for President Trump, who have praised his response, his personal efforts, and, and that of the administration. We're all in this together. And I really feel very strongly that one of the essence of the American DNA is we fight together and we win together. And that's where I feel we're starting to emerge, especially on the economic side, with Congress working in such a bipartisan and bicameral way to provide direct relief to the American people. Uh, I wanna invite members of the Georgetown community into uh, with their questions in a moment. But before we do, I'm gonna to just toss one, uh, one question out to all of you. So for those of you in the Georgetown community, if you haven't sent your questions in, now's a good time to get into the queue. Um, but look, we're, we're talking about leadership tonight and what our leaders need to do. And a big part of that is mobilizing and inspiring and calming the public. And so my question to you, um, at a time when much of us out here are terrified, right? Being told that we shouldn't leave our homes. Um, how should our leaders be messaging this to, to the, to the, uh, to the American people? What would each of you encourage everyone from the president down to you know, our local mayors and community leaders? What should we be saying? 
What should they be saying to us? Um, why don't we just, you know, anyone can jump in here with your thoughts on it. Um, but I know I'd like to hear. Yeah, Rebecca, I see you put your hand up. Go ahead. So I, um, I'm, I'm sure others will have much more nuanced answers, but what, what, what I think what I want to hear is what I want, what, what we are hearing from some of the public health professionals. So what we hear from Dr. Fauci, what we hear occasionally from the Surgeon General, which we don't actually hear as much. We're not hearing daily uh, press conferences from CDC. So we're, we're actually not necessarily having the messages communicated from the public health side. But I think the, the I, understanding that people... So, some people have a lot of anxiety. Some people are scared. And I think it's important to say that the next, the next couple of weeks, maybe the next couple of months might be hard. And we might be asking people to, to sacrifice some of their personal liberties to, to stay home. But the, the actions we're asking people to do are protecting our society. They're protecting not only themselves, but they're protecting the most vulnerable of our communities. And I, I'm not, I, I think the, um, I don't know how much more we can scream that from mountaintops, and I'm sure that there's better communicators out there. And I think to the governor's point, the, the, the challenges our healthcare um, workers are facing is just, it, it, it is so disturbing. And the, the messages that they themselves are saying are, you know, we're at work, you stay home. And that, and we have to keep repeating this, that the, the, the most we are asking people is to stay home. And I think that there is an entire, we are as a community, we'll come together and, and do everything we can to support each other. But that this is, these are, some of these social distancing measures are going to be critical for saving lives. Ron? So look, I think, uh, once again, we've seen a lot of really bad communications from the White House that have put us in much worse shape. As recently as 10 days ago, as the president said, there were only 15 cases and they were going away. And now we have, uh, we'll be at 15,000 probably by tomorrow. And that obviously uh, misled people and didn't send the right signals to the bureaucracy to prepare. The first senior public health official who raised a red flag in public, Dr. Nancy Messonnier, who I worked with on the Ebola response, she's a 30 year veteran of CDC. As soon as she said in public that this was going to be a serious problem, she was banned from further public appearances. Uh, of the uh, White House Coronavirus uh, Task Force. And so that kind of uh, messaging uh, has a very negative effect. Now, what's interesting is the president's done all this in an effort to kind of spin the stock market up, to kind of persuade people this isn't going to be that bad, telling people that it would go away with the summertime, a miracle would make it go away, was a statement two weeks ago. And so, and in fact, what's happened, Mo, is that far from reassuring people, it's unnerved people. The more the president tells them what isn't true, what they know with their own eyes isn't true, what they're hearing from experts like Dr. Tony Fauci, like, uh, like Dr. Ann Shukat, the more they're hearing all that, uh, the, 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 the president's incongruous statements uh, uh, reverse the idea of confidence, reverse the idea of security. So I think it's important. And in fact, even again today, the president making statements about vaccines and therapeutics that aren't science-based and that his own, that his own science advisors have to go out and contradict uh, hours later. And so uh, we, we need transparency, we need candor, we need science-led leadership. That's the kind of communication that's gonna reassure people, that's the kind of communication that's going to uh, tell people that we've got a plan in place uh, to, to fight this thing effectively. Jeff is both a doctor and, a, and a, a former elected leader. What do you think the message is that we need to communicate? And And also when you look at all these images of of spring break on the beach and people hanging out in large groups. It's clear that whatever message is being communicated isn't resonating with everyone. And so I'm wondering if you could give your thoughts on that as well. You know, well, for starters, in another week, you're going to be seeing images of emergency rooms being full and you're going to be seeing a different image altogether. You know, America is a very broad place. People respond differently. Uh, people, you know, whistle by the graveyard, as they say. Um, this is something where the communications here, I, I, I respectfully disagree with Ron that all of this criticism of how the administration is speaking is not as helpful as it could be. You know, 
they can do a better job. No question about that. But, and, and all of us have to do a better job. All of us have to have a message that is, this is a different war. This is something that we're going to fight it on the other shore. We bought ourselves some time. It's going to take a very long time. This is probably going to peak in May or June and then come back down and then perhaps come back uh, for us and still continue on. This is going to be a long battle. And I think the leaders need to start communicating. And it's not just the medical side. And the medical side, we are, we're always not very good communicators. And the political side are always not very good communicators on healthcare issues either. We have to communicate that we're with you. We're going, to, we're going to fight this. We together as Kansans or as Americans, we're going to be working with each other, trying to figure out how to help our neighbors, how to live in this new environment, what great new ideas are there out there. And we're also going to grieve a little bit together. And we're going to make a whole lot of mistakes because we're all in unknown territory. I've walked through about 25 different war zones over the last 25 years. And this is walking through a war zone. And America is not used to that. We've never done that as a country before. And so I think speaking as a governor or a president or just the, your neighbor is, we're going to be there. We're going to be strong. We're going to have ups and downs. This is going to be a fight that we will win. And I think that's the messaging that we really need to take. Yeah, Tony, and then I want to bring in the first student question. Sure, and I look forward to the questions as well. I'm, I'm going to take another shot at this one. Uh, this is an unprecedented global challenge that is being managed in real time. It's something we've never dealt with on this scale before. Um, I'm trying to take a step back from viewing this through any partisan critique or any partisan uh, accolade to any one side. However, I will say as follows. The president has taken a much bolder a role in this crisis, certainly in the last few weeks. I think the daily press conferences have become very helpful, and he is surrounded by Dr. Fauci, as well as other uh, experts and, and medical professionals who are giving the right guidance and who are giving the clear guidance. And the American people are starting to uh, obviously follow suit. We are a very large country with a very diverse population that is very used to freedom. So we aren't necessarily as accustomed uh, to, to maybe sheltering in place and stop, stopping our movements as perhaps other countries are. And our governments aren't used to these types of uh, moments where we have to call for these types of things. So I understand why there's uncertainty and why there's some, some volatility. And I would just re remind us that we do still need optimism. We still do need the belief to see the forest past the trees. This is a crisis. We are going through it. It's gonna probably get worse before it gets better. And as long as we as Americans are able to work together and stick together throughout this process, I think we have a much better chance of, of mitigating the negative impacts across our society, our economy, and our country. Hey, Bo, can I just respond to that quickly? Yeah. The part of sticking together is not racism. And so when the president stands up there every day and calls it the China virus, and we see Chinese Americans getting beaten, see Chinese Americans getting bullied, there's no reason to do that. You don't have to call it the China virus. He wasn't even calling it the China virus a few weeks ago, only as he's gotten into political trouble over it, has he started calling it the China virus. Right. You know he's calling it the China virus. Listen, I don't know why he's doing that, to provoke people it's not. And, to, and to spread hate. There is no, the WHO has said it's not the China virus. We have more people dead in Italy now than we have in China. We have the disease being imported from Europe, which the president knows since he banned travel from Europe, so he must know it's coming from Europe. And so, uh, so, so, so this is just, again, this is, this is fatal leadership I understand, I understand to distract the campaign. This is not a political event. I'll say the following, very simply, go to the earliest reporting on this issue. Reporters across almost every media outlet refer to this originally as the Wuhan virus. Yes, Tony. Where it originated. And it has continuously been referred to in some matter or form by journalists and others in that vein. So let's please not turn this into a Biden versus Trump conversation. We're talking about leadership. Let's start showing it. Actually, yeah, leadership. Actually, actually not uh, doing let me, racism. Let me, okay, that's what leadership includes. Ron, the let's, president is doing racism every day. Ron, let's let Rebecca have the final word on this point and then really want to get to the student questions. And, and I would just note that there was, there was actually, yes, the, the virus was referred to in different ways at the very beginning of the outbreak, but there was an, an actual internationally 
recognized process led by the WHO to name the virus. It has an official name. We've all we switched from calling it NCOV. It's now called COVID-19. And the fact that, that I think, I, you know, separate from all the politics, it, it has a recognized name. And I, and I think even just straying from the name that the World Health Organization has given this outbreak is, uh, and, this, and, and, and the disease is, is a statement in and of itself. Okay, thank you. Let's go to our first student question. Uh, Alec, Cam, hi. Uh, Alec, you there? I'm here. Great. Well, tell uh, us who you are, school and year. Will do. Um, I'm Alec Kamhai. I'm a senior math econ major. Uh, good to see some of you again. Uh, Tony, my question's for you. Um, in 2017, economists warned that the tax bill would increase the deficit, which it did, and they also warned that uh, increasing the deficit in good economic times would make it a lot harder to respond to a recession in bad economic times. Uh, now that we're almost certainly headed to a recession, my question is, first of all, was there any concern about this in Treasury at the time? And second of all, are you concerned now that the Treasury is hamstrung in its response? Alec, it's good to see you. I remember you from a lot of our discussion groups, and you always ask smart questions, mostly uh, uh, opposing my view, but always very intelligently. Uh, look, we always scored the tax bill on a, a 10-year window, and we said it paid for itself across 10 years. That was proven uh, by the numbers. We also assumed the baseline uh, growth of sustained GDP around 3%. That's probably going to be challenged, but there's absolutely no doubt that what the tax reform did was invest uh, a, a lot of money and had a lot of money reinvested into our economy through our, our lowering of the corporate tax rate, our incentivizing capital expenditures from business. We've had the best job market in over 50 years up until about a month ago, largely because of the tax bill. Wages have gone up for the first time in 10 years, largely because of the tax bill. And individual incomes um, have gone up and Americans' tax liabilities have gone down. Don't forget, we doubled the standard deduction that helped every middle income family in America. We simplified major parts of the tax code. We gave small businesses their lowest tax rate since the 1930s. That's why up until about a month ago, we had an economy that its fundamentals were very strong. Right now, we don't have an economy that has bad fundamentals. We have an economy that's dealing with a global public health crisis that has pushed significant pressure downward on that economy. But because of the tax bill and other regulatory relief, parts of the president's agenda and trade trade changes, we've had up until about a month ago, the best job market, the best wage growth, and the best sustained economic growth we've had in a very long time as a result. Um, okay, so let's go to Nick Carey. Good evening. Hi, Nick, we hear you. Great, uh, so I'm in, a, uh, in the Executive Masters in Emergency and Disaster Management, and uh, my, my question goes to Ron and uh, the governor. So uh, the fundamentals of emergency management are that Emergency management is dealt locally and is at the local level. Um, why is it the, go the federal government's responsibility that the states and local hospitals and municipalities did not prepare for their, with enough gowns and masks? So I, I saw Ron earlier was speaking that it was the federal government's fault that these hospitals didn't have enough masks. But if you look at the fundamentals of emergency management and if these county emergency managers, they should have been preparing for this for the last 10 years with expectations of training through FEMA and other agencies, why don't they have enough masks and gowns? And obviously at some point they reach a, where they run out and then the federal government steps in. But the, I think it's too early to put that on the federal government when we're only three weeks into this and local municipalities are running out of equipment. And so when do we push that back to the local? I mean, they wanna be in charge when there's a hurricane, they wanna run it and they want FEMA money. I think we should put it back on them that, hey, this is also your disaster and you should be taking charge and, and in the future, uh, maybe you should stock up more. Thank you. Jeff, you want to give the first answer to this? Sure. Uh, a couple of things. One is, I, I agree, these are largely local responders are, are there. Um, they do get resources from the federal government, so that's part of the criticism of it. But there is always a local component that is really the most significant one. The local component is you are going to be the first responders. You're there. You handle those things. So in an earthquake, it's usually the local folks in the first day that do most of the rescues before you have disaster teams and all of that uh, arrive at a place. And you have different local responses. You know, the federal government, for example, the Surgeon General 
uh, last week uh, or this past weekend said elective surgery, hospitals should call up elective surgeries uh, now in order to preserve supplies. And in many places, those elective surgeries are going on. We canceled them personally uh, here, but I've seen you know some hospitals cut it off immediately. I've seen others, they're still doing it. They're looking at different things and they're trying to respond as best they can with imperfect information. And so you have so many people making hard decisions, uh, you're gonna see a lot of variability. Ron? Yeah, I'll just add, I, I agree with uh, virtually everything Governor Collier said, and I think it's a, it's a really good perspective. We do have this really complicated system that they don't have in other countries. That I think serves us well most of the time, which is in the UK, they have a very unitary system. The federal government's very, very powerful. They kind of make decisions nationally and push them down from London. Same thing in most other European countries. Here we have this very pluralistic system where governors like Governor Collier, when he was governor and other governors make a lot of decisions. Our uh, healthcare systems, both private and public, uh, private actors make a lot of decisions. Uh, you know, so we have this very complicated system and it, and it, it serves us well. I think it gives us resilience, it gives us creativity, it gives us innovation, but it also makes it harder to organize something like this, where you really want some kind of top-down leadership on some key points. Now, the federal government has a role, it has a big role. Inside uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, there's a whole a, uh, uh, sub-department called the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response that's supposed to kind of coordinate these things. And supposed to look ahead and say, hey, we have this big new virus threat that's going to overwhelm local hospitals, and we need to get organized. And we need to organize the supply chain so we're getting the supplies to where they need to be. It's going to hit different parts of the country at different times. And if we just let every single hospital kind of do its ordering, the hospitals that are best connected and have the best relationships with the suppliers will get the stuff whether or not they need it or not. I was really uh, struck by Governor Collier's earlier comment about rural hospitals, and they're the hospitals sometimes that don't have the best connections with these suppliers, but they're going to need supplies when the disease hits there. And so in our pluralistic federal system, it is important that in a crisis like this, the folks who can coordinate, coordinate. And that's really what should be coming out of ASPR and out of the leadership in Washington is kind of getting these supplies to the right places, so on and so forth. Yes, state and locals lead. Yes, they're first on the ground. But this is a national crisis. It requires national coordination, national organization, or else these rural places uh, other hospitals are just going to be left out of getting the supplies they need. Thanks. All right. Our next question, uh, Neelish Manandhar. Neelish? Hi, my name is Neelish. Um, I study environmental biology and English in the Georgetown College. Um, my question is, um, just, just reading the news, it seems like Andrew Yang's idea and Sanders' ideas, such as universal basic income and universal health care, etc., are becoming a lot on Republicans and mainstream Democratic um, Democratic people's minds. Well, I'm just curious on will this change Republicans' long-term views on more socialist policies, and in general, how will it change the landscape of American politics of uh, this pandemic uh, for the American politics question? And that goes out to anyone who'd like to answer it. Well. I think it's pretty tailor-made for a quick response here. No, we will not be espousing uh, socialist policies, uh, nor do I think the majority of uh, moderate and independent thinking Democrats in this country ultimately probably wouldn't want to either. That, that all being said, and let's talk about the moment we're in. The moment we're in is a significant um, crisis in that if we don't immediately deal with the financial and economic ramifications, we possibly create um, a year of, 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 of real uh, significant downturn in our economy, which can be avoided. We have a strong economy. The fundamentals of the economy are strong largely because of pro-growth free market policies that the president enacted over the past three years. That being said, to no fault of their own, the American people and American businesses are confronting this crisis. Government needs to responsibly encourage them to slow down operations during this time to prevent the spread of this public health menace. So therefore, we do have to have uh, some sort of governmental support for these businesses, for these individuals who are going to suffer uh, for a temporary period of time, uh, a significant downward pressure. And that's why I think you're seeing a coalescing of the uh, governmental 
uh, entities in Washington right now from both sides of the aisle that say, listen, let's, let's hold off on ideology for a second. Let's do what we think needs to be done uh, to significantly improve uh, the ability of our country and our businesses and our people to get past this, this very severe storm right now. And let's hopefully set up our economy for a strong bounce back uh, and very robust bounce back sooner than later. Yeah, if I could just uh, step in here, uh, having gone toe to toe with Tony earlier, let me agree with a lot of what he said uh, on this one. Uh, not so much that the economy was in great shape before all this happened, and the Trump tax cut gives credit for that. We'll we'll have that debate another day. But I, but I, where I agree with Tony is that um, it's not socialism to say that if the government's going to make your business shut down to make all of us safer, we're going to help you through that. It's not socialism to say if we want workers to stay at home for a period of time because it's gonna make all of us safer, we're gonna replace your income for that period of time. That just seems to me like whatever your ideology is, whether you're more of a liberal Democrat like me, but not quite a socialist, or more of a Republican like Tony, that seems just fair to everyone, uh, given the circumstances here. And so I think that's why I think, uh, again, I agree with Tony, that's why I think you're seeing kind of general bipartisan agreement on a lot of the big pieces of this package. Yes, there's gonna be some fighting about how the industry bailouts are handled, what the restrictions are, things like that. But I think, as, as Tony said at the outset, the big pieces here, help for individuals, help for small businesses, uh, some kind of sectoral help. Uh, you know, there's broad bipartisan agreement because this is a different kind of situation. This isn't a debate we're having about economics. We're having a debate about how you have an economic response to a public health crisis. And so I think that's why this is um, getting such broad bipartisan agreement. All right, thanks. Let's try to get in a few more student questions. Uh, next is Emily Fisher. Emily, are you there? Hello. Hey, Emily. Yes. Hello, Mo. How are you? Good, thanks. Hello. Thank you all for having me. I am a sophomore in the SFS studying international politics, co concentrating in law and ethics. And my question is a bit more particular for um, Dr. Coiler. Thank you um, for coming, all of you. But in particular, I'm hoping to know on with rural health, I appreciate you discussing rural health and hospitals. How best do you think individuals should be tested in rural America? So the question is really about testing, is it, Emily? Uh, yes, specifically, and so, resources. Yeah, so this sort of test, well, let me walk you through what this test is. This is a test that you need what's called a PCR machine uh, that looks at the DNA uh, of the virus. Uh, and it has to have enough of it there. Um, to, to run one of those machines, it requires a lot, of, uh, a lot of coordination. You have to verify it. It's usually about a two or three week process on this. Um, many, most state health departments maybe have one of these machines, maybe two. So government, you know, the government's response to do all of this testing is very limited. However, Many major hospitals have the same equipment on board. The private sector, you can buy one of these machines from Roche that can do a thousand a day, uh, but it takes a little bit. You're going to see all of these crashing through. Um, but rural hospitals usually don't have as high a technology. You've got to be, you know, you could be in Hayes, Kansas, which has 30,000 people in it. But uh, going uh, to uh, a smaller community, they may not have that technology. So what they often do is they, we've got to get them access so that they can test and get that test responded back quickly. It's literally maybe you do a swab, it, you give it to a guy in a car, and he drives it 100 miles uh, to another place. Uh, or if you don't have to have it immediately, it may be... Uh, sort of FedEx, it gets there the next day. Those small hospitals need to have access right away. And the only way that we can do that is expanding the commercial sector. And we're starting to see that happening. And I think it's going to take a couple of weeks. But you need a doctor that can order the test, make sure that is appropriate uh, for people. And we've got to have a large quantity and disperse it out. And I think you're going to see more and more of this, but it's going to require a lot more effort uh, as well to really make it happen. Okay, okay thanks for the question. Uh, next question comes from uh, Eshan Gupta. Yes. Uh, 
Hi, uh, I'm Ishan. I'm a freshman in the SFS, uh, probably studying science, technology, international affairs. Um, and my question goes out to anyone um, of the panelists. It's essentially about the media. Um, uh, post H1N1 in 2010, there were a lot of like issues and people now who are saying like the media might be over sensationalizing the situation. And because of that, a lot of people may not be responding adequately. Um, in the coming months, what is the role of the media um, in terms of balancing, kind of making sure the correct information gets out there, but not necessarily making people feel like it's being over sensationalized or stoking like panic amongst citizens? What side should they err on as the media to make sure that like people understand the gravity of the situation without it getting out of hand and panicking too many people? Uh, does anyone, Tony, you want to take a crack at this? Sure. I appreciate uh, the question and especially the idea that the media will listen to me. That would be a first in the, of quite a long time. Uh, look, I actually think one of the most interesting moments uh, in any of the press conferences is the president the other day you know, saying that, look, to, for, for, for the most part, we haven't gotten good coverage. He hasn't gotten good coverage in the media. He even you know, potentially said maybe that's the responsibility of, of, of the White House and, and some things there. The bottom line is if you are covering a story of this magnitude, uh, clearly there are going to be aspects of your coverage that are influenced by the way your media outlet views the president, either support or against. That being said, I do think we've gotten to a very – uh, good point now where I do think the information that is being shared is, is largely being uh, reported objectively. Uh, I think the vast majority of media outlets are trying to cover this as what it should be, an actual uh, major crisis our country is confronting on a public health, public safety, and economic uh, basis, a global crisis at, at that. Um, but clearly, we, we want to try to, um, on all levels, uh, reassure the American people and just and provide them with clarity and facts. And uh, I would certainly hope the media focuses on uh, what, what is being um, covered as, as actually happening uh, and not necessarily project, you know, some of these side commentaries about, uh, you know, through the more partisan lens or their partisan views against the president. I actually, if you want my, my, my personal view, I actually just wish we could, uh, stick together during this one and not turn this into a complete partisan exercise, which the media has avoided a bit, but sometimes can't help themselves, which is just part of, part of the uh, nature of the beast, I guess. All right, we're coming up on the end of our time. I want to try to squeeze in one very last question. Uh, Nathan uh, Bergen, uh, Nathan, if you can uh, take the mic and ask your question as succinctly as you possibly can. I think you're on mute, Nathan. Um, oh, no, I should be. Yeah. Good. Okay. Right, good to go. Um, hi, everybody. I never thought I'd be asking this wearing a uh, sweatshirt and sweatpants, uh, but let's get right through it. Uh, I'm a junior in the School of Foreign Service. Um, I study essentially global health and biotechnology. Um, so this is an interesting time for me. And my question is, assuming that we don't see any uh, major pharmaceutical options on the table, vaccines, antivirals, so on and so forth, um, a lot of models have projected we see a pretty significant second wave. Uh, and that's also based on, on precedent from previous, uh, previous pandemics. So how do we keep the appropriate uh, policies um, and how do we keep people compliant with them once we reach like a five month, six month point uh, in terms of asking people to continue to socially distance? And, and that's a question for anybody. Great, Rebecca, why don't you take this one? Thanks. Thanks for the question, and um, wonderful to hear you studying uh, uh, global health in, in SFS. Um, okay, so I think there. I think one of the challenges we have right now is trying to figure out what the path forward looks like, and that's going to be a bit of a challenge when the we're, we're getting more information every single day and trying to figure out how to um, how to balance. Uh, really robust social distancing measures with our ability to function in society and have a functional economy. Um, the, some of the models that have been being put forth this week uh, suggest they, you know, originally were coming out and saying that we really have to go through a full on um, social distancing and it may last up to 18 months. And that's just I, trying to get our heads around that is extremely difficult. And I think one of the really interesting things that's happening over the last 24, 36 hours is that public health professionals across the country have been trying to, um, trying to work our way through these models and try to figure out what a roadmap might look like. And I think that we have examples from, from parts of, of, of Asia on ways that are working 
but not necessarily adaptable to, to an American context. But I think that there, we, we can start to see a path that, that includes starting with pretty um, uh, universal social distancing measures and then moving into a, a situation where when we have robust testing and we can test pretty much everybody, and we can do, um, then we can do targeted isolation, we can do targeted contact tracing, you could do con- drawing those concentric circles to do quarantine. You can start, and, and that might take, technologies that we don't yet have available yet, including cell phone location data, including data on, on possible cases and location data, and, um, and then even eventually get to a point where we get serologic testing so we can figure out who may have, who has had the virus and who may have developed a, a immunity to it, and actually understanding even how long that immunity will last. So I think all of this to say, and trying to say succinctly, because I know we're at the end of the hour, that, that there may be a path forward. And I think that there's, I think one of the, the most exciting things about, there's not a lot of exciting things going on. This is a really difficult time, but what I, I keep trying to focus on, on some of the good, and some of the good is that we have the smartest minds in the world who are now solely focused on pandemic preparedness and response. And I fully expect that we're gonna see um, a tremendous amount of ingenuity and, and ideas that our community has never been able to even contemplate before. Uh, come forward. And and for that, hopefully we will all be better off. All right. Thank you so much. Um, And with that, uh, we've gone just a few minutes over. Um, So I want to thank on behalf of the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service, uh, the McCord School of Public Policy, our partners at uh, Georgetown's Global Health Initiative. I want to thank Dr. Rebecca Katz, Governor Jeff Collier, Tony Sag, and Ron Klein, for uh, what I suspect will not be the uh, the last spirited conversation that we have uh, on this topic. And for all those of you who uh, joined in to listen, thank you for taking time tonight. Um, please continue the conversation online on social media using the hashtag GU Virtual Forum and tagging at GU Politics. And please stay tuned for uh, more events uh, as we uh, continue to navigate this, this new normal of ours. Uh, so with that, good night, everyone, and thank you very much.